In this Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Yannick Silver, one of the legends of direct response marketing, copywriting, business in general. He talks about some of the mentors he's had, the big lessons he learned, what he learned from spending seven weeks with Richard Branson, and much more. Bear with it because there's great insights. We are on hotel Wi-Fi, so we did our best to get the audio through that and much more. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of inspiredinsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm truly honored to have Yannick Silver, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing, and who I consider one of the legends of business in general, for that matter. I've been following you, Yannick, for a very long time. I'm always inspired by what you do. So this is especially and I'm especially excited about this one. And just for all of you who don't know who Yannick is, a lot of even the people I interview, the high-level entrepreneurs say they started by listening and learning from Yannick. But he started with his first million-dollar idea at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he's bootstrapped seven other products and services a seven-figure mark from scratch without funding, taking on debt, or even having a real business plan, which we'll get into. He's the author of several best-selling marketing books and tools, including Maverick Startup, Instant Sales Letters, 34 Rules for Maverick Entrepreneurs. He's the host of the annual Underground Online Seminar, which is noted as a top 10 event for entrepreneurs by Forbes. I've attended several times. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, he started Maverick 1000, a private invitation-only network of the on top entrepreneurs and industry transformers. Now, this group assembles for breakthrough retreats and giving forward opportunities, and to date, they've raised over $1 million. Some of the participating icons include Sir Richard Branson, Tony Hawk, Tony Shea from Zappos, Russell Simmons, Tim Ferriss, many more. Now, I'm going to stop talking and let Yannick talk, and Yannick, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. Yeah. And... I know your uh, Yannick is on a hotel connection, so if it seems like I'm talking over him, there is a bit of a delay. So I apologize for that. And Yannick, my first question is: You've befriended so many of the top business minds in the world. You being one of them, how did you first connect to someone? What's a memorable connection that you've made? Uh, yeah, there's so many of them, and you know, for me, they're really about like working on genuine connections and in, in, in an authentic way. Like there's. There's a lot of business celebs, I won't mention them by name, that, you know, I have pretty much no intention of of ever really trying to connect with just because I don't totally believe in what they do. So for me, it comes from really wanting to get to know somebody who has had an impact a, on my life and who I think has a great message that I want to share with people that that follow me uh, and and also just to, you know, get get into their sphere a little bit about it. How do they do? They do. It's just fascinating to me. So, you know, Richard Branson has been my biggest business hero for a long time, and now I've been really extremely fortunate to spend almost uh, seven weeks with him on his island and in safari in South Africa, and and have like you know so many other things kind of kind of saying yes to opportunity. And for that, it was uh, it was my buddy Joe Polish who who first met Richard, and uh, I. So I've had some different run-ins. Like I, I'm on Virgin Galactic, so I signed up for there. So I, you know, met him real briefly through that. And then my buddy Joe had had met him at a charity function and had given him this great, um, you know, it's, it's always about what. Also, he gave Joe gave Richard a great strategy that he used for um, for Make a Wish, and Richard wants to know about it for his charity. So they got a contact and they decided to put on this this once a year event and and Joe's like, hey, do you want to sign up? So I was a guest. I was like, yeah, absolutely, I want to sign up. And so, so you got to pay to play in that right environment. And then from there, you know, Joe and I have been friends, and we're like, well, we should do this together. And it turned into these uh, these multi week now retreats. And so the, my thinking at the whole time has always been like, how do we bring really smart entrepreneurs together and help Richard with his charity with Virgin United and things that he's doing and what he's interested in? Because it's not a fake thing. It's about how do we like Virgin United? I believe in what they're doing by using their power to solve these issues. So it always comes back to how do we? Yeah, and 
I guess one of the big things is, so what did you learn? What was the top lessons you brought home with spending seven weeks with Richard Branson and probably other top level business minds? Because it does seem to be all about giving back when you're, when you're working with these people. Yeah. I'll challenge you, Jeremy. So I eliminated the word giving back from, from my book. I, I, I did have that written down. I did have that written down, actually. <laughs> Because um, I watched that talk and I actually noted as a copywriter, but go on, yeah. I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, so why? Exactly. Copywriter, right? Words are super important. And, and any, any words that we're saying to ourselves or we're using where we are and, and saying the words giving back, which have become de facto kind of vocab for business owners, for people, it just implies that we've taken something. Right? It, it's not, there's guilt that we have to give back. And quite frankly, as entrepreneurs, business owners, we're providing a tremendous value or we're out of business. And so I always look at how do we provide 10x to 100x value in return for whatever someone's going to pay us. And so that's the value piece. And for me, I look at it, you know, giving forward, I don't think is a great, as good either. But so I talk a lot about impact, like how to create impact or, or ripple effect. And so, you know, getting out of like, just, I don't know, like it, it almost gives this this impression of oh you've taken now now it's time to give back to the community and i i don't i don't believe that uh so you know i've challenged people and they, they you know start thinking about it and just like thinking about that giving back uh and then the second part of uh, your question was about what lessons have i learned? yeah top lessons like when you're on a seven week retreat with some of the best business minds what's what's something that you brought home or do you remember from that trip yeah i mean a lot so being able to hang out with Richard and like he lives on Necker, so you get to see what he's like day to day. It's not just in a very compressed, you know, hour time period or keynote and, and poof, he's gone or whatever it is, but really just seeing how he is. And so I picked up a couple of things, I mean, a lot. And I, I keep a journal where, where I every single, you know, almost every day I write in my journal and, and the days on Necker are some of my favorite days to write in there. And so he's really present. I mean, you talk to him, you have a conversation with him. He's not fiddling with his Blackberry or iPhone or whatever. He's present. He's focused in on, on you. And, you know, the guy has probably a couple other things going on that he could be <laughs> focused on. So I picked up on that. Uh, um, he says he also doesn't even bring a cell phone typically out with him just so he is truly present. And I, I love that. Uh, he, he's always setting his own rules, which is one of my favorite things. And, and you see it in big ways and small ways. Like, you know, in big ways, like when he started Virgin Mobile, they didn't build out an infrastructure. They didn't go out and buy the uh, the towers and build all these things and spend billions of dollars. They piggybacked on someone else's network, I think, like Sprint in the U.S., so just using someone else's network. And that way, he had the leverage to go big if he could, and if it didn't work, it wasn't a huge loss or a, you know, a, a big concern that way. So real rules are not falling the same way that somebody else would go in there. And I see it in small ways, too, like we're playing pool – and I'm shooting at the eight ball and he's like taking the cue stick and like, you know, whacking me with the, uh, in, in my inner <laughs> thigh there and just trying to throw me off my game. And then like, you know, I swear he made up rules while we're playing, but, but I did beat him the, the second time around, but, <laughs> but like even, even just small things like that, just setting, setting your own rules and just the way he lives his life. Like, I mean, that's why he's been my biggest business here. It's like, yeah. not only has he been incredibly successful in what he's done with business, he cares a lot. He cares about people. He cares about having an impact. Uh, and he also just, you know, has that adventurous spirit about him, which which I I really relate to in a big way. Yeah, and that's one of the 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 things I really look up to you about is when you when you pick a mentor, a distant mentor, or whatever mentor, you want to that person embody what you like and and want. And I find like, you know, giving back is huge for you. You also seem to maintain a balance of family, which is important, uh, you know, amongst all the business stuff. Um, and I want to find out also from you what um, what industry icons or people uh, are left for you to meet. Who's on your yeah. bucket list? Because at this point, you've met so many people. Who's left? I don't really have like I mean I have a list of people that I think are really intriguing and right. that we have for our Maverick retreats and different things that we do. But it's not it's not like a oh cross this off I met so and so got the picture. It's not the picture, but, but the relate like a genuine relationship yeah. with right. It's, I mean there's uh there, there's a lot. For sure, and you know, it, it comes from that that genuine place of like just seeing what what these people are doing. Like uh, Magic Johnson is really intriguing to me, from how he's built up some of these uh, these urban environments and 
and and really taking his fame to that next level. Uh, I'm really impressed by Empire Builders, uh, who like Sean Combs, you know, P Diddy or whatever he's called these days, Jay Z. Um, a lot of the hip hop moguls who've capitalized on on what they're doing to really create these lifestyle brands and and different different categories of what they're doing beyond on just their spot. I'm really intrigued by by something like that. Uh, you know, I just had an opportunity to hang out with Russell Simmons, do yoga with him, and and I really you know, doing with his again different brands. Like I'm, I'm certainly intrigued by by people like like that who have multiple multiple things going on. Uh, Gene Simmons with his licensing prowess and what he's done with KS been interesting. And yeah, so sometimes it's more about one certain aspect. Sometimes it's really that holistic pic you know, going back to Branson again, like that's a true holistic picture of someone that that I, I really care about. And it's interesting, like when, when you find your mentors or people like that, it's there there's something inside it. Like it's it kinda high like I look at other people being mirrors for who I am and whether it's good or bad or something that triggers you in a negative way or a positive way. And if it's a positive way that you're really inspired by somebody, it's it's because you have that same quality in you and it it helps bring it to the surface. Yeah. And if you admire that in someone else, it's it's something that you, you have as well. Yeah. And I always like to include fun fact, Yannick, about the guest. And for you, a fun fact is you're an adventure junkie. And you've done so many things as far as, you know, crazy experiences. What are some of the things you've done? What's been the scariest? Uh, I think the scariest has been the Halo skydive, probably. Actually, cool. Halo skydive, which is from 30,000 feet, and you're wearing an oxygen mask. And you have to uh, have this oxygen mask on for about 45 minutes as you're getting up to altitude to get all the nitrogen out of your bloodstream. Wow. And if you don't, you get the bends, like the reverse bends, because you're so high up and... Halo is invented, it's called high, high altitude, low opening. It was invented essentially as a military insertion that planes would be flying at you know, commercial altitude and it wouldn't get picked up on radar and then it insert troops that way. And it's really interesting. So it was scary for me because of the fact that you couldn't take off your oxygen mask, which would lead to some really bad things. And, and that was one of the first times that I realized that I was slightly claustrophobic. <laughs> and, uh, it's not a good yeah. time to realize that. Yeah, so so just working through that and, and relaxing through that, and um, so that that probably made it made it a little scarier and and interesting, and and then going just jumping through there, it's, it literally felt like Google Earth. You're like, all right, well, <laughs> I guess we're gonna do this, and it just felt like a video game. So that's that's probably one of the uh, one of the scarier ones. So what do you bring to these? adventure junkie experiences to your business for me it's always about a different way of of like looking at things like it, it just really it really inspires me and like if you you have to be in a complete flow state typically if you're in a really high adrenaline kind of situation mm -hmm. and and it just turns everything else off um, I also find that the more the, the, the different situations that I'm in or the more unique kind of kind of places that I'm in, or things that I'm doing, just lead to new connections for new ideas, and and you know if if it's done with somebody else, it leads to a really good tight bond and unique connection. Like there's definitely neuroscience around that. If people are in high adventure activities, they they actually bond at a, at a higher level, and that right. that to me is really, really interesting. So I'm always interested in how do we how do we connect? You know, for me, it's all about entrepreneurs but how do we connect entrepreneurs at a higher level than just hanging out yeah. at a bar for a beer or something right it's like a high level fraternity for entrepreneurs without killing your liver type of thing <laughs> yeah, yeah sometimes i mean it's, it's more than it, it's more than it's kind of funny because i kind of created your own fraternity i'm like eh, sort of <laughs> and uh because i was never in a fret in college i played ice hockey which which is kind of like a fret but not necessarily and but it's you know it's never been about being a boys club it's it's definitely you know guys and gals yeah. and it's about more about who they are as a person like I'm I'm really inspired by the members that we have in, in the group who are at the top of their field and who also want to grow and that's that to me is the most interesting thing is who wants to keep growing and evolving not just their business but their contribution and their and you know have some fun in the process yeah and. I mean, the real question about that is, how do you get your wife to, com you know, convince your wife to let you go on these crazy things? 
That is an interesting question. Uh, so, I mean, the funny thing, I guess, is my wife kind of skews the exact opposite for high adventure stuff. So it's not like we share that in common. But she has become kind of that that home base for me, and and she that that steady person in the background that can really help watch the kids while I'm away doing some crazy stuff and and keeping that stability. And but she's also like she knows me, she knows who I am, and if if she really put the kibosh on that adventures part, I lose something there. Like I actually had this conversation with uh, with one of my other mentors, this guy named Frank McKinney. And Frank builds these crazy, like, $20, $30 million houses on spec in Florida and then uses a lot of profits wow. to, to build these self-sustained villages in Haiti. And we just got back from Haiti together with him. And we literally had this conversation because we're both very big into a child and that keeps, like, that spark alive and that, that, you know, you can just see it in people's eyes when that spark has died. And by not letting, you know, if, if your wife's kibosh on, on the adventure side, that has something to do with also the sparks and imagination to your business. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. So we were talking about your wife letting your true inner self and personality come out, right. um, which is important. But I, I was just wondering about that because I know you have kids and a wife and you know I can imagine telling her, I'm going to go skydiving where I have to have an oxygen mask and <laughs> her yeah, reaction to that. That one. I mean, for me, it's like, my kids right now are eight and six, and I really want them to see me as, as an example of someone who's living their life mm -hmm. full out and not necessarily being completely reckless and doing dangerous things for the sake of doing dangerous things, but truly living your life. And, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing, like when you have kids and a family, to be like, okay, well, I've done all that. I'm putting it away. But literally something dies inside you if you don't, if you don't nourish that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to hear about, and I want to get into Evolved Enterprises and kind of the evolution of you and your business, but um, what was it like growing up? I know you, you came from an immigrant household. What are some tough parts and what were some fun parts about the immigrant, you know, growing up as an immigrant household? Uh, yeah, I, I, probably anyone who has immigrant parents or heritage would, would relate. Um, so we came over when I was about two and a half, almost three, uh, from, from Russia to the U.S., and my parents came over with about $256 in their pocket, not really much use of English language. And, you know, as, as immigrants, they, they did what they need to do. And that's one of the things I really respect. And at one point, I thought I wanted to create a book on this immigrant success factor, like why immigrants are four times as likely to become millionaires than, than naturally born U.S. citizens or, or probably any other typical country where, where immigrant, immigration kind of occurs. Uh, and... So, so I got that firsthand, like seeing from my dad, uh, where he started his own business about, I think about a year, maybe a year and a half after he came to the country, he worked at a hospital and he started moonlighting on the side, repairing medical equipment for some of the doctors and, and the administrators found out and they're like, well, you know, you can either stop or we're going to have to fire you. And, and he decided to do the, uh, the riskier route and, and, uh, went and started his own company. And so since I was always the one that had a better uh, grasp of English, I was sort of in charge of everything. Marketing. And so that's where kind of maybe the copywriting and stuff really, really started. So I was 12 and doing these silly, ridiculous ads. Like they have a big, huge whale on top of the, the page. And then it'd be like, you know, this is a whale of a deal. And yeah, selling medical equipment. And I was 14. I was telemarketing. So my dad gave me basically the, the, yellow pages and calling dentists out of the yellow pages selling latex gloves and telemarketing is during the AIDS scare so I was selling gloves and following up on my own leads and selling them and then when I was 16 the deal was I got my own car but I'd have to cold call on doctors and so he's like okay Mr. Yannick go make some sales and and so I got the car and I'm the 16 year old punk essentially talking to these 50 year old doctors and, and you know, I pretty quickly realized that it sort of sucked cold calling. <laughs> yes. and I decided that it would be much better if I, don't know, I got exposed like to some of those were into direct response marketing, which actually one in particular was. And he gave me a Jay Abraham tape. And I was literally 17 and he gave me this Jay Abraham tape. And he had just got back from like a $5,000 seminar. He's like, would your dad ever send you something? I'm like, no, no way. And, 
And uh, so I just listened to this thing over and over again and loved uh, direct response. And that's that's kind of how it started. But like some funny stories growing up, I don't know. It's just like there's so many things like that are just strange. Like I didn't have sneakers until I was like 14, maybe. Wait, like, say that again. It got cut out for a second. Say that again. I didn't have a, I didn't have a pair of sneakers until I was like maybe 14. Like I had sandals and not even like cool sandals. I had like leather European sandals before they were cool. And, uh, you know, so just like random stuff like that. Like I also remember like my mom had a very Italian fashion sensibility. So she was buying me as a kid, like instead of tidy whities that had like colored tidy whities <laughs> So like burgundy and forest green and all these colors. And literally I remember, uh, <laughs> you know, this might be a little bit off the wall, but literally I remember like sixth grade, like parties, we're playing like spin the bottle parties. And I'd be like, oh, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I should wear like the dark blue ones because <laughs> less, they're less strange. So stuff like that is always fun as an immigrant child. That's great. I appreciate the, I appreciate those fun stories. Um, that's what, that's what sticks out. So what did you think, um, you know, from, you, know, you were always into copywriting and yeah. what was the first breakthrough that you had uh, from when you were kind of on your career path with, with copywriting? I think the first one was definitely, you know, where, where I kind of left off the store at 17 years old, you know, 18. The, the great thing about my dad's business was that I could experiment with anything. So I'd literally walk in there like the Joe Sugarman style full page ad for actual gadgets really worked really well um, for what we were selling and we were selling medical equipment. Before we'd have to go face to face and try and sell whatever it was, EKG machine, fetal Dopplers, you know, we had about 250 manufacturers we represented. Uh, and so I would write these ads for sterilizers, for fetal Dopplers, for Sigmoidiska, I mean, all sorts of stuff. But using that full page ad kind of process, and my dad would look at it, he's like, nobody's going to read on this. I'm like, oh, let's try this, see what happens. And we would literally get, you know, people giving us their credit card uh, for, for products on the low end. Uh, we were even selling like three, four thousand dollar products straight off of that page, wow. um, from, from my copy. And then we were also getting people raising their hands and saying, yeah, I'm interested. So it was a lot different, you know, talking to them than it was. So it just changed the dynamics of my dad's business tremendously. It went from a small regional player to we could advertise nationally to doctors. And that was, that was a huge, huge win and big, big breakthrough. Was there anything you changed in the copy and the ads from the lower ticket items to the several thousand dollar items that you found worked? Um, I mean, the biggest thing was that we were on the higher, the really, really high price stuff. We we're going more for lead gen, and in order to to get somebody to just give us five dollars or whatever it was straight off the page. So we did that, and it worked. It actually worked, uh, but we. we be getting more ways and hey, I want to see a demo, and that was that was still a big breakthrough. And but the the other thing on the lower end ones when we we're trying to go straight for the sale, like the fetal Dopplers, like I remember one ad in particular had like a thousand some percent return on investment. So every wow. dollar spent, we had a thousand dollars come back, which is pretty darn good. Um, yes, for sure. Yeah, I mean the big thing was using reason why, and that's one of my favorite things to do all the time is give people a reason why you're doing something, and it's a yeah, it's a psychological trigger. It's a hot button. Uh, Joe Sugarman talked about this. Uh, Robert Cialdini from Influence Psychology Persuasion talks about this. It's it's really really powerful. And so the reason why was around. Um, is, I mean, the headline was like something like you know why can we sell these fetal Dopplers at X amount, which is like significantly lower than what the retail price might be. And the real reason why, and it's true, was like that manufacturer wanted to give us a discount so that we could take a whole bunch of inventory in and then push them and sell them and get other doctors kind of more more familiar with these particular types of fetal Dopplers. And we told them about that and we said, well, but instead of keeping the, you know, the savings and having a higher margin, we'd rather pass it on to you so you'd be more loyal and, and buy more stuff from us. I and mean, that was a rough kind of, you know, synopsis of it. And, yeah. and that worked really, really, really well. Yeah. And so that reason why is was super powerful. Yeah. I, think it was I, I love that. That's what are some of the other kind of, when you're sitting down to write copy or whether it's for Maver Maverick 1000 or Underground, what are some of the structural components you make sure to hit on? Um, I mean, the, so a couple things. I mean, I'm always, that reason why is a big one. Like why? 
I'm always thinking about what are somebody's objections and then answering them, hopefully with a story, ideally, or a case study or a testimonial or just something. Um, I'm also thinking about like how, like what is going to be engaging for them? Like how do I get them into the copy as soon as possible? Um, and then what's, what's kind of the big hook? What's the angle? Like what's my positioning of, of how we're going to do something here? And for a lot of the copy I've been writing recently, it's, it's, like I've I've definitely evolved and changed where it used to be more of the hard hitting, kind of only benefit oriented copy, and and now it's it's a little bit more subtle. I think uh, I think the consumer is smarter than ever, and and you need to give them credit just like, like you're talking to somebody that you totally respect. And and I think the worst copy out there is stuff that that really just looks at at people as that. You know, they learn all these triggers and, and you're going to just kind of trigger people and then get them to buy. And it's just, you know, it's just so transactional. Like, I think there's a higher level for what we can be doing with our business and people want to latch on to something bigger. Your team wants to do it. And that's part of what Evolved Enterprise is about as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, I want to get to Evolved Enterprise. I want to see, you know, because you didn't come up with this overnight. You, you've evolved. Right. What are some of the things that, um, you know, I guess list some of the products and services you've created throughout the years so people kind of see that evolution. And then I want you to talk about kind of how you came up with Evolved Enterprises. Uh, yeah, a couple of the big highlights, I guess, would be here around. So the very first thing that I put out there, so working with doctors, uh, had a lot of doctor clients, and I was supposed to, to Dan Kennedy and, and Ted Nicholas and a few other people that were selling information. I'm like, wow, this seems like a really interesting thing. And I, I put out a course, how to get more cosmetic cases. And it was all for, it started with dermatologists, like they were getting crushed by managed care. And so put out a course. Uh, it's kind of a fun inside little story. Is like I, I put an ad out in dermatologic surgery, got 10 leads in, um, sent out some reports that were, you know, sales letters, slash reports talking about marketing and what they should be doing. And and then on the last day of the deadline, it was inside this thing on third notice we got an order oh, okay yeah sorry Jerry. um so right before the third notice we got we finally got our first order and literally i was like running up to the fax machine every day for those couple weeks like hoping someone's going to buy and the fax comes through and uh and i look at it and i'm like you know so excited that somebody gave me 900 dollars for this course and and just you know just so super psyched and yeah i think my switch to phone because it comes in much clearer all right, you're coming in. Can you hear me? All right, yep. Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it this way. Um, all right. So we were at you were you were just telling the story about some of the big breakthroughs on your business, and you're getting to after the the cosmetic uh, surgeon information with Ted Nicholas. So what was next after after that? Yeah. So after that, so so literally, I you know where we were, I. I uh, had had the first order come in and sent back a note to the doctor saying, "Hey, this is being republished. It'll be available in 30 days. We'll charge a card until then." And I uh, got to work on it. You know, work until like three o'clock in the morning many nights, just putting this thing out there. And then that turned into a uh, a really nice, like ten thousand dollar, fifteen thousand dollar a month business uh, when I was about twenty five, twenty six. And at that point, it was really, you know, the internet was starting to make more sense, and and I was seeing a lot of a lot of opportunity out there. And literally at three o'clock in the morning, as you mentioned in the intro, was the first uh, the online piece that I put out there called uh, Instant Sales Letters. And literally jumped out of bed at three o'clock in the morning, got to work on this thing, and and the first month it made like eighteen hundred dollars, and then it was like thirty five hundred dollars wow. next month, and then like seventy eight hundred dollars the month after, and. You know, I was on track to do six figures within four months, and I was like, "Wow, this is pretty cool." <laughs> and and then people were like, "Well, how did you do that?" And maybe you could teach me. And you know, a big part of it was because I had learned all about direct response and copywriting from you know applying it for many years. It wasn't like this overnight success, but it yeah. looked like one. And so the next part was kind of like the evolution was around helping other people take their interests and hobbies and passions and and turn them into content that they could sell. And so. You know, I'd literally been involved in every single piece of like selling ebooks for a couple bucks to super high level programs for forty thousand dollars plus, and everything in between from live events to coaching programs, and you know, kind of name it. But 
maybe a couple of the other highlights for like underground which is you know our 10th anniversary this past year yeah congratulations and yeah thank you and it was literally created on the back of a delta boarding stub hanging out with one of my friends who just got back from an internet marketing seminar and he's like ah he's like it's such a big pitch fest it's ridiculous and he's like you know what i'd love to see is this real people actually doing it and i'm like ah that's exactly right he's like you know a lot of people when you put this thing together and literally on the back of a delta boarding stub that's how that was formed and I've always found that works incredibly well for me is like that, that going the opposite direction of what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the internet marketing world had a lot of the same sort of people on stage and, and the same things going on. So, so I'm like, okay, well that, that never works for me and I'm not interested in that. So let's bring in real people. And so that, that was where the underground came from. And then uh, kind of this evolution into Maverick, but about seven years ago, I looked at my life and I was like, you know, I'm not, not totally happy and I really should be. I'm making a lot of money online with our different businesses, had a great family, great reputation, and just realized that I'm happiest when I'm hanging out with really cool, smart people, yeah. uh, working on big ideas and having some fun and making a, making a difference in some way. And that's, that's where Maverick was formed, around those three pillars. Mm-hmm. So how do you know, I mean, you have so many ideas. How do you know what one to pursue, what one that may not be worth it for you to, to carry through? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's something that I certainly wrestle with a lot. Yeah. Because if, for me, it's uh, it's where my passion and energy goes. It impacts where, where I'm going to spend time. Yeah. And if uh, you know, I can be happy and excited about an idea one night, and then if it doesn't sustain, then I know there's, there's not something there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so definitely around your energy level and where your passion is. And, and then, you know, the other thing is, uh, it's interesting, like when I started Maverick, we had some, some you know, I put about $400,000 into the company wow. trying to figure out what it was. And, you know, my wife's like, okay, so is this for real? Or is this <laughs> just something that you're just playing around with and, you know, it's fun to go, go Baja racing with these other people and, you know, it's great to go do a zero gravity flight with Tony Hawk, but is this a business? Is this something that, you know, yeah. what are you doing? Because I wasn't really focused on the publishing company, and, you know, and I wasn't that excited about putting out a bunch of new products around in the internet marketing space. Like, yeah. I looked at my life, I'm like, I'm not going to be in internet 10 years from now. I don't want to be an internet marketing guru still. That's, you know, I think I have a much bigger, essentially, place. And Purpose and vision, yeah. Yeah, and so having those kind of sideways things by putting a bunch of money in there and trying to figure out what it was, it made me redouble my, my efforts and, and have a bigger vision of what it really was and decide, okay, am I, am I committed to this or am I not? Because there's a much bigger picture around what it is. And so that, that was really powerful. I think a lot of people are in that place where they have something and they just put a ton of time and energy and then we get the, the conversation with the spouse, which is, okay, what are you, when are you going to do something with this? Uh, conversation. How did you then turn it into a viable business where you weren't just pouring in time and energy and getting something, you know, back obviously relationship wise, but from the, you know, the uh, financial side too? Um, I mean, I really, so I start following some of my own advice, which is one of the Maverick rules, which is like, you know, you have, don't, don't, uh, don't have unlimited capital to keep pushing into something it's like mm -hmm. if you have if you have a small amount then you're going to be more creative and you're going to have to get stuff done mm -hmm. and so by having kind of an open checkbook policy that that kind of mm -hmm. kind of hurt me because it took a certain amount of hits on the head to realize okay what are you going to do with this and um and by having you know if i had said okay i'm going to put fifty thousand dollars in and whether or not it works you know, we'll figure it out but I was so passionate, I was so, you know, wanting to make that thing happen that I was like, well, we'll, you know, we'll keep funding it and we hire people we didn't need to hire at the beginning and just all sorts of stuff. Um, so I think, you know, I think a big thing is, is just making it like serious in your own mind and deciding, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are you going to do with it and not making excuses that you're, you know, whatever, you know, we're, it's pretty easy for us to make excuses and rationalize different things. So it's, it's just like being, being serious about it and deciding, you know, if it's almost like becoming your own consultant. Like if someone else came to you and was consulting with you on this thing, like what would you tell them? And and that's that's pretty powerful. So what was a big breakthrough you had with Maverick that um, kind of got you to the next level? 
Um, it's nothing that I didn't know before. I mean, the biggest thing was that we were we started off doing adventure travel kind of stuff for high level entrepreneurs, combining with business, combining with philanthropy. But there was no real glue and no real community and and nothing that that would you know that that we had on the calendar in place. It was more one off stuff. Mm-hmm. And so when we turned it into uh, ongoing membership as a monthly fee and then things that they got throughout the year, it really it really came together. So what's one of the most exciting, because I know you go on a lot of adventure travels with them, what's one of the most exciting ones that you put together? Oh, there's there's a lot. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, just recently, one of my favorite ones has been the Ice Hotel in Sweden, where oh, cool. you know, I've always wanted to, to spend the night in the Ice Hotel, which is uh, it, it's something that melts every single year, and they rebuild it and have entirely new rooms designed. It's just amazing. Wow. What they do there. So we went up there and I kind of fell in love with the snow again. It's kind of funny. You know, I, was, I was having kids. Like, I love playing in the snow with them, but when mm-hmm. it snows here, where we are in Maryland, it means cleaning the driveway. <laughs> and, you know, it just, doesn't mean the same thing anymore. Yeah, you know, some hassles. And, uh, and so I kind of fell in love with snow again and had fun. And it was perfect because the room I stayed in was called uh, Cold and Crazy and it had these amazing, like, snowmen out there that you could actually walk behind and, and get into and have fun with. And, mm-hmm. Um, so it was, it was awesome. We did that. We did dog sledding. We did, uh, we went up into this wilderness lodge. Uh, we, we took a helicopter ride around Stockholm and wow. we did, we walked on hot coals and we just had like an amazing bonding experience that the members, uh, just really shared some great stuff together. And, uh, and then we spoke at the, uh, Stockholm or Sweden, was it Stockholm School of Economics or I think it was Stockholm School of Economics which is a pretty prestigious business school, and had the members go in there and teach uh, an entrepreneurship class. Yeah. I want to hear, um, Yannick, about Evolved Enterprises, what it is, how did you come up with the idea? Yeah, so I think a lot of people are kind of on the same path, which is really exciting to me, is seeing that there's a higher purpose with business. And, you know, you know Richard for Virginia and I will talk about, you know, business as a force for good. And John Mackey, who's co-founder of Conscious Capitalism, the CEO of Whole Foods, that killed, mm-hmm. you know, talk about that there's that there's really a, a consciousness to capitalism, and, and involves your your mission, and involves your people, and it involves a higher purpose for your product, and a big why. And, and so this is this has been coming up from a lot of different places. And to me, what's really exciting for me, and actually at, at evolved uh, enterprise dot dot com or dot org, you can see my presentation. It was the first presentation that I've ever gotten a standing ovation for and that, yeah. was, that was really exciting. I saw that. It was and, good, yeah. Yeah, and it's all, it's all about, you know, a big business coming from your true core, like what is your true calling around it, yeah. wrapped around impact, which actually automatically creates a community of people that want to spread the message and and then also your team is so on fire with what you're doing that there's a bigger mission behind it, mm-hmm. that they rally around it, and that the product or service itself has cause or impact built into it ideally, and it actually increases revenue and, and it, when done correctly, and that that to me is most exciting. So, you know, Tom Shoes is a good example of it. They really pioneered or, or got famous for that buy one give one type thing, and now they're a three hundred million dollar company, uh, which is just yeah. you know, astounding to me. Uh, just a few weeks ago, for our, our LA retreat with Mavericks, we brought in a guy named Dale Partridge, who's CEO of Sevenly.org, and and they donate seven dollars for every T-shirt sold or, or accessory now for apparel mm-hmm. that they sell, and they donated three and a half million dollars in the last two and a half years to different charities, which is which is a big deal and pretty awesome. But the really interesting stat for me was that he said new new business is accounted by eighty percent of social share. So the community wants to share that they bought this and that they're doing mm-hmm. good with their with their dollars, and so that's that's really powerful to me. I mean, with the, you know, I'm not going to say give back, but I'm going to say impact. You know, with, yeah. you're doing this stuff all along. So, you know, with Maverick, or, you know, you, you actually raise a lot of money. You make, a, you create a lot of impact with the entrepreneurs. What is Evolved Enterprise going to be? Um, I see Evolved Enterprise as like an overlay that people will, will kind of, if they're looking at maybe reinventing themselves or their business, so mm-hmm. it could be their next chapter. Mm-hmm. It could be also a, you know, if they're deciding to put something else out into the marketplace, they mm-hmm. can have the Evolved Enterprise 
principles in there. If mm -hmm. uh, someone's just starting up their business, they, they mm -hmm. look at how do they add Evolved Enterprise I see. into what they're doing. So it's like a movement where people can basically use these principles um, for their own business or their own life? It's, yeah, it's a framework, and it's a framework from going from transactional mm -hmm. to transformational to transcending business as usual, and, and and which actually you know impacts and helps everyone along along the way. So you know, transcending at the, the highest level is really intriguing to me. Like, how does a business not only become about what the product or service is, but about so much more? And just as a small little example. Um, the guys from G Adventures are a pretty big travel company in, in Toronto. And one of the things that they've really pioneered is they used to do micro loans and things like that with communities they do trips in. And that's that's all great. I, you know, I believe in the micro loans. But what they would do is like for instance in Peru in Machu Picchu on the on the uh, Inca Trail, they would stop at a certain place. They would provide capital to, to these different women women that were doing weaving and, and handiwork and actually have their guests participate in it. So they got a unique experience, uh, which which enhanced the experience of their trip. And then it also built up that community there and it made it more self-sustaining. And to me, that, you know, that's just one piece because it impacts everybody, right? It's like they have a better story to tell when yeah. they get back. And and so that's just one little, little example of it. Yeah, so with Evolved Enterprises, now, where do you have to, you know, it's hard because you have so much stuff going on. You have so many businesses. What's something you are going to have to focus on less because of Evolved Enterprises? Or is it just going to be a structural thing? You, you can kind of focus on everything um, as is. For me, yeah, you know, for me, the Evolved Enterprises are like that overlay. So I look at it as that, that it just uh, kind of permeates everything that we're doing. So it's not necessarily a separate piece, but it's something that, we want to make sure that we're adhering and thinking about those principles as we're as we're building out what we're doing. Uh, so it's not necessarily a need to stop doing one thing. I got it. But that it just yeah. Okay. And then what what have you heard from you know obviously you got that standing ovation at that talk and everyone should check that out. Um, what have you heard now afterwards? You know because it's one thing they listen to it. What are some of the implementation that you've heard of? Because I know you have contact with a lot of. Uh, entrepreneurs, what have they done because of what they've heard from you? It's uh, it's definitely still early, and like so, we're doing. I have a group called called Maverick Next, which uh, are these young entrepreneurs, twenty five and under, mm -hmm. and I work with them on on brainstorming around their their business and how do we how do we create that that true impact and and positioning that that gives them this unique advantage and has the evolved enterprise principles. So. We've been we've been working on on some of that, and it's it's not just a sprinkling of oh we give you know five percent to this particular charity, but how do we actually authentically weave it into what they're doing in their business? Mm -hmm. And that's been that's been really exciting. They haven't they don't have it out yet, so I'm, you know I don't think I'm at liberty to share exactly what their examples are, but right. but there there are things that you know are beyond just okay we give a, a charity donation, but it works with. Yeah, you know, for one person's business, it works with um, with with inner city communities and actually provides a better value for their end mm -hmm. user and an educational function for for that community. So it's like, you know, everybody wins and wins in a bigger way, which is exciting to me. So it's kind of more self sustaining instead of just giving money, but making sure it kind of creates an ecosystem. Yeah, and and I love the way you, you know the ecosystem is a big thing that that I think about. Is is not just one piece, but how do how do you create these interconnected pieces and, and parts that are that are that are driving everything else and and you know, lead back into each other? So the other question, I don't know if you can talk about it, but I got an email about underground. Um, can you talk about that? I mean, I got the email, and you know, someone puts out an amazing product that I actually got slightly depressed when I got that email. About well, underground, can I talk? Can I ask about that, or is that still? Yeah, yeah, you can okay. ask about it. So I got an email, and it basically said the era of underground, as we know it, is not going to be the same. It's not going to continue. So I have to ask about it because I emailed Missy immediately and said, "Is this for real? Like, is this just like 
creating some kind of scarcity for, for me to go next year or what's, what's going on? <laughs> And, and so yeah, I want I, you to talk about that. Is, is, is Underground as we know it really ending? Uh, partially. It's evolving. Okay. So, uh, you know, Underground has always been about internet marketing and bringing in people behind the scenes that are doing some really impressive, interesting things. Yeah. And then uh, I've also sprinkled in some, some unique people like, like Frank McKinney and talking about philanthropic capitalism this time and, uh, and what what they're doing in Haiti and so forth. And yeah. then, you know, some different people that really don't fit the internet marketing yeah. kind of piece, uh, that are more like strategic level thinking. So it's going to be, it's going to be called something else. It's going to still have underground at its core, mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely going to gonna be evolved and, and it's going to be in line with kind of where we're going with evolved enterprise and, and Maverick. Yeah. I mean, I've made some of my best, favorite relationships through going underground and um the only reason i didn't go this year is because my wife was going to be due right around that time and so i couldn't uh uh leave her in the lurch so but, risk it. yeah i get it i've uh I, I left my wife seven months pregnant to go running with the bulls and she still hasn't <laughs> forgiven me for it she went into free term labor so you're probably smarter than me in that uh, yeah like, so i want to know who are some of your mentors you have a lot of people you mentor um, through personally and through your courses. Who are some of yours and the best advice they've given you? Uh, yeah, some of my favorites are, are kind of not as well known. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously we talked about, you know, the Bransons of the world and Russell Simmons and so forth. But for me, it's also about, you know, this guy, Ari Weinzweig, who, uh, who co-founded Zingerman's up mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor. Yeah. And he has this amazing Zingerman's community of businesses, and I love what they're doing there. Where, where one business, you know, you talked about Ecoverse, like they, they've really created this Ecoverse and vertical integration in a way that, like, they just, you know, they just get it and they do so many great things. And so, you know, I learned from Ari whatever I can. Like, he's he's definitely one of the people that, so originally, kind of coming up, I thought, you know, missions and values were kind of bullshit. How do you discover but, that? I mean, my wife went I, to U of M, so actually I've been there, and that's the only reason uh -huh. I would have known about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I have diverse reading, and I just love, you know, I'm, I'm curious about a lot of things, so when when something piques my interest, I'll, you know, someone also writes a book, like he, he's written a really great book called uh, The Lapsed Anarchist Guide to Building a Great Business, is the first volume, and he's got several volumes after. Okay. Definitely recommend reading that. So, I don't know, I mean, I just will come across people, and they'll tell me about people, and I just will go research somebody in... Like to me, I'm I'm always intrigued by people doing interesting stuff that has a bigger meaning than just you know being successful in their business mm -hmm. and fully integrating it. So they do a great job with their culture and their team and and just this really amazing environment. And and so I was always impressed by by what they did. And 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 then so I brought Arian to speak a few times to a few groups. Mm -hmm. We brought a group up to him and done field trips up there. And so he's he's been someone that that I looked to, up to in that way. Uh, this guy named Chip Conley, who's a former CEO of Joie de Vivre hotel chain, mm. second largest boutique hotel chain. Uh, and, you know, just, you know, once again, like, like mentorship through their, their books, I guess. So he has a great book out called Peak and then also Emotional Equations. Mm -hmm. And then Chip and I have gotten friendly and, you know, I just love that he's, he uses Maslow's hierarchy about, everybody like customers that stay at the hotel it's about identity refreshment at the highest level like who are they truly at their heart and, mm -hmm. and having the hotel reflect that and and then with their team like what's a bigger purpose besides just a paycheck yeah. and so you know it's it's exciting like you know guys like Tony Shea all about culture and happiness and you know to me those, those are the kind of people that I'm really really intrigued by and, and love learning from about Stuff that's much bigger than, than just business. Yeah, and I know we're about out of time, um, so I wanted to ask um, one more question and then hear about where people can check you out and everything, but um, what are some of the big mistakes that you find when you're talking to people they're making or they're asking the wrong questions? Um, what should we be thinking or not thinking? Um, I don't know, so we do, we do these startup competitions at each Maverick retreat. Mm -hmm. 
one of the big things that that I see a lot is is that these startups are really focused on I don't know this big grand kind of kind of picture of everything going well and, and going right. It's and not necessarily being like how do they sell whatever they've got at that moment, like to even see if there's any demand for mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. They'd much rather keep working on their product or service or or like almost anything else except for going out there and figuring out what's the biggest hook or angle or positioning or you know just getting out there and, and selling the thing and talking to people that, that actually have uh, have a vote with their wallets and, mm-hmm. or surveying without actually having people buy anything like to me I would much rather put something out there like write the copy like I did for the first cosmetic surgeon piece and get somebody to buy and then and then see what happens and right. it's you know right now it's this awesome golden age where like there's platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo that you can put something out there and see what your marketplace demand is too. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So make the sale first. Mm, I like that. What's the, what's uh, next? What's uh, what are you working on now that you're most excited about and where can people find you so they can check out and definitely check out that talk that you gave? Uh, I don't know. I'm working on, working on a lot. Uh, I mean, definitely around this whole Maverick mission and what we're doing with, with, uh, with the Maverick thing, um, you know, probably the best place is my blog at yonicksilver.com. Okay. And, and you can just see what, what we're doing there and, you know, spreading this, this philosophy of the evolved enterprise and, and talking about that and, and just spreading this idea about, about the Maverick mission and so forth. So, Yannick, for the underground, so there will be some kind of underground esque seminar. It will be a once a year okay. big event. Yes. Okay. I think Missy responded. She's like, "What? What is, what is this crazy guy emailing me?" <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got we've gotten quite a few okay. uh, people talking about it, and thinking about it, and then, uh, we should have actually an announcement out pretty soon about it as a as an early bird kind of thing. And then the last question is, who's been one of your favorite speakers that was who surprised you at one of the undergrounds? I, my personal, one of my personal favorites was Ted Leonsis. I thought it was unbelievable. I mean, I still think about that talk he gave at Underground. Yeah, Ted was awesome. Um, you know, also the fact that he owns my favorite hockey team, which didn't do very well this year, <laughs> but, uh, but otherwise all good. Uh, but yeah, Ted was Ted was a great, great surprise. I mean, I knew he was he was really you know wonderful from his book. So I should I take that back? Maybe not a total surprise. Um, I don't know. I mean, the people that that really like, I guess, surprise me are, are are some of the unknown people that we bring in, and then they, they go on to to do even incredible, more incredible things. Like Jeff Walker from Underground One, mm-hmm. this is where he is now, and yeah, he's a good buddy of mine. And um, I don't know, guy Joey Coleman who won Underground Nine Speaker of the Year last year, mm-hmm. and he's a Maverick member, and just you know, you, like you can just see superstar quality written mm-hmm. all over him yeah. with what what he's doing with the first hundred days and uh, I don't know. I mean there's there's been there's been so many. There's a lot. Uh, yeah. I just yeah. I, mean, I just I just love everybody for like the ones kind of most most interesting to me are, are the ones that are authentic and genuine and share a piece of, of themselves. Yeah. Yannick, I just wanna be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out your website and this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time today. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks for uh, bearing with us for the uh, technical difficulties. We worked it out. As long as it comes through, that's all I care about is that people can hear hear this. So I appreciate it. Cool. All right, awesome. Thanks, Yannick. All right, thanks, Jeremy. Bye. Even after doing hundreds and hundreds of interviews, there's still technology difficulties. Here are some of the outtakes of some of the technology not working because not everything goes smoothly. And I always like to include all of the clips from any of the interviews. Take a look, listen, it's not that exciting, but here you go. Testing. Now talk for a second. Uh, Hello? It's frozen.
Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Two, three. Yeah, it, uh, for some reason, the video's frozen. So what I'm going to do is yeah. I'll just... Oh, there it goes. No. Nope. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, it's still really pixelated. Um, let me see. I'm going to um, try calling you here. Hello? I'm going to hey. call... Can you just talk for a second? Okay. Uh. Just mute the Skype. Yeah, I did. Oh, you did? Is it still feedback? Yeah. Is it feeding back? Okay. I'm going to call, I'm going to try one more thing. I'm just going to call your cell phone um, from the Skype and see if yeah. that, that works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks for bearing with the technology.